All right. Um, in this particular video, I want to um, spend my time discussing uh, basically how we hormonally regulate. Well, I mean, in general, just the regulation of body water, but essentially how we hormonally regulate body water levels. Um, you know, bear in mind, before watching this video, I would strongly recommend um, watching a video that I made or any other video for that matter, do your reading on just generally body water composition and um, just kind of the general factors of osmosis, the influence of electrolytes and so on, because that's going to all play into essentially this talk. So make sure that you're, you know, you have a, a, a good understanding of um, just body water composition in general prior to watching this video. All right. Um, so basically, what I want to do in this video is I want to focus. Um, I want to give a brief terminology review, just because there are some key important terms that revolve around these concepts that you just need to be acquainted with and understand. You know, again, the con. You know, again, like anything else that we talk about, the concepts make sense when you break them down in a step by step by step fashion. But what tends to throw a lot of students off is just a just a lingo and the language that goes into a lot of this. So I just want to go over just a few key terms. Um, that you need to know or terms that I will just be using throughout this presentation that you need to have a good understanding of. And then what I want to talk about are three separate hormonal responses that revolve around, you know, body water regulation and also, you know, blood pressure regulation and so on as well. Okay, so, and those three major responses are going to be antidiuretic hormone, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and uh, atrial natriuretic peptide. All right, and again, I apologize. Um, I'm just getting over some kind of bug here, and my voice is kind of half in, half out, or I may cough once in a while, so I just want to warn you all on that, that I still don't feel the greatest, but I have to get these done on behalf of my students. So, um, <clears throat> so again, a little bit of terminology review. Uh, you know, the first term that, really, you know, that you really need to be acquainted with here is interstitial fluid. Remember, interstitial fluid is the fluid that's found within tissues, but outside cells. Okay, a good way to you know, a lot of people like to think of interstitial fluid as the fluid that cells are bathing in. Okay, so so for example, if this was a, a tissue space, and God oh, dang it. Drop my marker, sorry. And these are cells located within that tissue. Um, interstitial fluid would essentially be all the fluid that is in between the cells uh, within the spaces. And I apologize for not staying in the lines there. Okay, and uh, fluctuations in interstitial fluid levels are essentially going to cause, um, obviously, water imbalances. And so any imbalance we have in the fluid cycle of the human body or our ability to retain or eliminate water are going to are going to cause either sequestration or accumulation of interstitial fluid or a loss of interstitial fluid. Okay, so that's what interstitial fluid is, the fluid um, within the tissue spaces. Osmolarity, and you know, there's another term that's very similar to this called osmolality. Okay, they're really they are different, but not much. Osmolarity is essentially a measure of um, it's a measure of a solute, um, in, you know, per liter of fluid. Whereas osmolarity is essentially a measure of solute per mass of fluid, per key, you know, per kilogram of fluid. Okay, and when we're talking about basically concentrations of solutes in body fluids, there, you know, osmolarity and osmolality are so closely related that oftentimes these terms are used interchangeably. You know, you see this in books all the time too. Sometimes you'll see osmolality written. Sometimes os osmolarity written. Um, you know, I am just going to say osmolarity all the time just because that's what I'm more just accustomed to saying. But bear in mind that, the, the, that, these, are two, that these two are so closely related when talking about um, body fluid compartments and what the, you know, the composition of them that oftentimes are used interchangeably. Okay, and remember that the osmolarity of our body, you know, basically of our body fluid compartments essentially influences how water moves, you know, our water balance and how water moves around between the body compartments. Remember the two major compartments are, excuse me, extracellular fluid and, whoops, intracellular fluid. Okay, so, and remember that we need, you know, the normal, os and re remember that the electrolyte that, you know, has the biggest influence on this is essentially going to be sodium. 
And, you know, we normally want an osmolarity of about, you know, 300, um, you know, sodium ion, you know, milliosmoles of sodium per liter of water. Milliosmoles. Okay, sodium per liter of water. Okay, so essentially what I'm saying is about 300 sodium ions per liter of water. Okay, and, you know, and we want a, so that it will create a nice, you know, a nice little balance. Okay, between, you know, between the extracellular, intracellular fluid spaces, and remember that there's a lot of potassium in here as well, and which will create a nice even shift of fluid into and out of cells. Okay, so bear in mind that, odd, so that, so osmolarity, essentially, when we use that word, we're talking about the concentration, essentially, of osmotically active solutes that are within body fluid compartments, okay? And the one that we focus on the most is sodium, all right? And bear in mind that, you know, I said this in the, in, the, in the previous video about body water compartments, I'm going to say this again, a very important concept for you to understand, wherever sodium goes, water goes, okay? So basically fluctuations in, in extracellular sodium, because you remember, in, you know, fluctuations in potassium are not, you know, that great because most of the potassium in the human body is located inside of cells, okay? So being that most potassium is found within cells, and, you know, it, you just don't see it shifting around as quickly as, as, um, as sodium levels because, you know, you've got all this sodium in the blood and tissue spaces. It's in direct, it's in very close con direct contact with the fluid cycle or the, you know, the shifting of fluids between blood and tissues and so on and also being circulated in the kidneys and, and, and all that. So as a result, you know, changes in fluid levels, um, body water levels, are going to essentially affect the osmolarity or the composition of sodium within the body a lot more quickly and affect the osmolarity or osmotic pressures of the human body. So that's why we're going to focus on sodium primarily with, in, in this video. And um, as a result, bear in mind that, that, that the maintenance of water levels oftentimes is, you know, revolves around the maintenance of electrolyte levels and especially sodium levels of the human body. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Osmoreceptors. These are receptors that, oh, osmo, so we're already thinking water here, and you all know what, a, hopefully by now, you better know what a receptor is. Okay, you know, bear in mind that these are receptors, so basically these are sensitive to changes in, in, in osmolarity. Okay, these are sensitive, because remember, receptors are just specialized nerve endings that, are, that, that get irritated by specific changes in various aspects of our physiology. You know, we have mechanoreceptors, receptors that get irritated by changes in pressures of the body, you know, whether it's blood pressure or, you know, basically some kind of mechanical, physical pressure that takes place um, and, you know, somewhere within the body, all right, or, you know, whether we're talking skin or blood pressure and the aorta is stretched too much, or chemoreceptors, these are nerve endings that are sensitive to changes in essentially the pH of the bloodstream, and then they get irritated and generate action potentials to the brain and so on. Osmoreceptors get irritated or excited by changes in osmolarity, and these are essentially located in the hypothalamus. They, more specifically, which I'll elaborate more on later, is the supraoptic nuclei of the hypothalamus. Okay, um, so osmoreceptors, receptors that are sensitive to changes in osmolarity. And then hypertonic versus hypotonic, okay, what we're talking about here, these are words that are basically used to describe um, how concentrated or how dilute our, our tissue space, and our tissue fluids or our body fluids are in the body. Good Lord, our, um, the, the water is in our body, I'm sorry. Um, so basically, if you use the word hypertonic, what we're saying here is that our body water compartments, you know, are, have become more concentrated, or basically there's an increase in osmolarity. Oops. Okay, there's an increase in osmolarity. All right, so for example, so let's say here's a cell. All right, and if we're saying that our, our fluids have become hypertonic, that means our osmolarity has gone up. So let's say the osmolarity is 500, you know, milliosmoles of sodium per liter. 
Okay, so then as a result, now, so, well, 300 in the cell, 500 out. Well, now we have an imbalance in these, in these osmotic forces. Now there's going to be more water drawn out of the cell and into the tissue spaces, and that's going to cause the cell to shrivel up. And if we don't correct this by, re, by getting more water into the tissue spaces, that's going to be problematic for the cell. Okay, and that's essentially caused by dehydration or excessive water loss. Okay. And then hypotonic basically is the exact opposite. When our, <coughs> when our tissue, when our fluids or tissue fluids essentially become too dilute, okay, you know, like, uh, you know, excessive water retention or drinking too much distilled water or so on. And as a result, that's going to cause an imbalance in, in the forces of, of uh, uh, pressures of osmosis. And that's going to be the exact opposite of what we just described. That's going to cause a shift into the cells, and the cells are going to swell and die again if we don't correct this. Okay, um, all right. So keep that in mind: hypertonic, hypotonic, and then hypovolemia. Basically, just think you know low volume. Okay, hypovolemia, low volume, um, uh, and then shock. Okay, shock. Um, what? You guys have all heard that word before. What shock is, it's a, it's a significant decline in blood pressure. Okay. It's a significant decline in blood pressure. Okay. So if our, so if our body, so if we're hypovolemic, if we're losing water, okay, and we're losing volume, especially blood volume, that's going to cause a significant drop in our blood pressure. Okay. And if we don't correct this, then as a result, that's going to cause a form of shock. Okay. One of these forms of shock is, well, hypovolemic shock. Okay, essentially when you're losing blood, okay, at a, at a rapid rate, and that causes a significant drop in blood pressure. You know, so basically all the different types of shock are named based on their cause. Okay, this particular situation, hypovolemic shock, you're losing a lot of blood, you're, you know, a lot of body fluids, your blood volume drops, and that causes a significant drop in your blood pressure. Or there's neurogenic shock, where neurologically, for some bizarre reason, your blood pressure drops. Or there's what's called... Um, Anaphylactic shock, where you have a severe allergic reaction, you release excessive amounts of histamine, and that causes a lot of, um, basically a lot of edema and water to circulate out of your blood into your tissue spaces. Okay, or there's cardiogenic shock, where the heart is just losing its ability to circulate blood properly. And then as a result, you know, if the heart is unable to keep blood pressure up, then cardiogenic, cardio heart, genic creation, that's where the shock is created. Okay, so so the type of shock here, hypovolemic shock, just a drop in blood volume or water volume and i.e. blood volume in general. So that's what causes that. Okay, so these are some common terms that you need to know. Even if I don't say all of these a lot throughout this video, these are terms that you just need to be acquainted with because these are terms you're not going to be able to escape when it comes to patient care and understanding body water levels and so on. Okay, so on that note... Let's talk about uh, basically these three hormonal mechanisms that we use to regulate body water levels. The first mechanism I want to talk about is antidiuretic hormone, or another, or another name for it is vasopressin. Okay, vasopressin. Okay, we call it vasopressin because, you know, ADH um, can stimulate the smooth muscle of vessels to constrict, hence the term vasopressin. Okay, um, uh, but, you know, basically the name kind of kind of describes, well, kind of, it does describe the function. Obviously, it's a hormone, so therefore it's a chemical message, okay? Um, and antidiuretic, well, you know what a diuretic, you know, a, med a medication that's classified as a diuretic does. This is a medication that stimulates you to eliminate water, okay, to get rid of water, okay? And you know where diuretics, you know, what diuretics target, that would be the kidneys, okay? Because you know that your kidneys are the main organs on a regular basis that, that regulate body, you know, body water levels, okay? So a diuretic stimulates you to eliminate excessive amounts of water, you know, being that this is an anti-diuretic, remember anti means against, okay, against. So if we say this is anti-diuretic hormone, this hormone is going to prevent water loss, <coughs> excuse me, and this will promote water retention by the kidneys. So this is a hormone that is secreted as you know as a result of an increase in osmolarity i e dehydration dehydration 
Okay. <coughs> so remember the dehydration dehydration essentially is caused by water loss and but you know water loss more rapidly than than basically electrolyte loss. Okay, because you know one of the more common causes of dehydration would be sweating. Okay, so for example, let's say you're exercising, okay, and it's a hot day, or you're exercising in general, you're you're going to be losing water, okay, because you have to cool yourself, you know, as you're exercising, your metabolism dramatically increases, um, and you're 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 producing more heat, you have to eliminate that heat to keep well, essentially keep yourself alive, okay, and you do this by circulating blood to the you know to your to the sweat glands and then as a result you eliminate this water onto your skin and then heat is carried out with that water and then the water evaporates off of you and you see the salts on your skin accumulate or your clothes as you sweat but you're losing water a lot more rapidly than you are um, these electrolytes so as a result when you're so in a situation like this where you're severely dehydrated you're going to um, when it's severely but just dehydrated in general all right you're going to have an increase in osmolarity so your body so basically your tissue fluids um, your interstitial fluids and, and blood and so on are going to become more highly concentrated with sodium all right and um, this hormone is secreted by the posterior pituitary, otherwise known as the neural hypothesis. And the target for this hormone would be the kidneys. Okay, so let's talk about, um, let's kind of talk about the regulation and secretion of antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so let's say here would be the hypothalamus in the diencephalon of the brain. And we'll say right about there would be the optic chiasm. All right, just a hair above, you know, up here, there's an area called supra optic nuclei. The supra optic nuclei. That's why they're called supra optic. They're above the optic chiasm of the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the neural pathway of, you know, the optic nerves heading back towards the brain. Remember that, um, you know, when you look at the eyes, okay, you have your optic nerves that project you know away from the retinas toward the brain and eventually they will converge a little ways back and you know the 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 fibers from the retinal or the the, the medial nasal fields will cross over to the other to the other side and then you form what are called the optic tracts and then remember from here these will synapse with the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus and then you have these optic radiations traveling to the occipital lobe so you can so you can process this visual information okay right about you know this is an important you know the, the chiasm is a very important landmark to understand you know you know and because of you know the the pituitary gland the hypothalamus and other important areas of the brain okay and just above the optic chiasm is the area where we were you know where this regulates the or not regulates but essentially monitors the osmolarity of our blood okay so essentially what's going to happen then is as our osmolarity increases that's going to cause an increase of the Oops, it's going to cause an increase in the activity of these neurons or these osmoreceptors within this area. Okay, and then basically, so remember, just kind of review your your the basics of the pituitary gland. Okay, okay, sorry, my markers are going a little crazy here. All right, remember that there is a the pituitary gland has an anterior lobe and a posterior lobe, and remember that the posterior lobe or the neuro hypothesis directly is, is, is a direct downgrowth of the diencephalon of the brain whereas the anterior pituitary gland kind of originated up in that that, that the upper you know oronasal pharynx you know from the mucosal lining of that area and migrated into the brain okay and then as a result you know this is, you know there's a different means of control for the anterior pituitary versus posterior so remember that posterior pituitary hormones are synthesized by neurons in the hypothalamus are transported to the back of the gland and are stored there until they're needed okay so if we're in a situation you know again you know where we're profusely sweating and we're losing water all right but our osmolar but we're not losing salts as rapidly as water remember that causes an increase in osmolarity Okay, so what that's going to do is that's going to increase essentially the activity or the firing rate of these 
osmoreceptors in the supraoptic nuclei. Okay, and remember that the neurons of these of these particular areas, their axons project down into the posterior pituitary. So if we increase the activity of this of this center, essentially the hypothalamus, it's going to start generating action potentials into the posterior pituitary, which stimulate you know the, which which is going to stimulate in this particular situation the secretion of ADH into the blood. Okay, antidiuretic hormone into the bloodstream. Okay, and then vice versa. If we become you know if we become very <coughs> sorry, if we become you know if we just take on too much water, then that's going to you know either when our either our osmolarity is going to be normal or if we become if our body fluids become hypotonic or you know too diluted, then that's going to decrease the activity of this area of the brain. And that's going to cause a decrease in ADH levels. So remember, the stimulus for ADH secretion is an increase in osmolarity. Okay, an increase in osmolarity. All right. And then now, antidiuretic hormone then is going to circulate via the blood, obviously, into the kidneys. Okay. And more specifically, the targets, the specific target in the kidneys that this hormone interacts with would be the, I'm just going to abbreviate this, the collecting ducts. Okay, remember the collecting ducts are essentially where the nephrons drain their tubular fluid um, into, you know, there could be up, you know, from a few to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of nephrons, you know, kind of collecting at, at, at collecting ducts, hence the term collecting ducts. And basically by the time fluid is in the collecting duct, it's been processed, we've gone through the reabsorption and secretion process, of the tubular of that fluid moving through the nephron. Now, realistically, what happens in the collecting duct is now we just determine how concentrated or how dilute we need this urine to be. Okay, so what's going to happen then is as ADH levels rise, you're going to circulate more antidiuretic hormone to the kidneys. Okay, and then basically ADH is going to bind to its receptors because remember this is a this is a protein, this is a hormone, this is not a steroid. Okay, um, <laughs> let's remember, and it's going to bind to its receptors, and it's going to basically activate the adenylyl cyclase secondary messenger system. Okay, and basically it's going to activate, you know, the use of, you know, cyclic AMP, which is the secondary messenger in this particular situation. All right, and then what that's going to do is that, so let's say here's the collecting duct. What that's going to do is that's going to create these little cellular vesicles to fuse with the kind of the walls of the collecting duct. Okay, and then basically, the, and then they're going to form these channels called aquaporins. Aquaporins, okay. <laughs> So basically, as fluid is traveling through the collecting duct, if we form these aquaporins all along the walls of the collecting duct, well, that's going to cause that's going to cause water essentially to escape from the collecting duct, get into the interstitial fluid spaces of the remember the remember the collecting ducts are located in the renal medulla or the um, pyramids of the of the kidney and then basically this fluid is eventually going to get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream okay so then as a result as this fluid gets reabsorbed back into the bloodstream that is going to cause you know an increased retention of water and hopefully we'll start to dilute um, you know get our osmolarity back down to normal all right now, as a result, you already, I mean, you know, this is easy to figure out. You probably already thought this. As ADH levels rise, you, you know, that's going to cause a, d a decrease in urine output. Okay. It's going to cause a decrease in urine output. Okay. It's going to basically give your urine color. All right. It's going to give your urine color. It's going to increase its specific gravity. So you can remember, specific gravity essentially is just how dense urine is. Okay. And the more water that's in urine, the less dense essentially it is. The less you know, the 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 um, the less proportion there is, you know, is water compared to solutes. But if you're pulling a lot of this water out of the out of the basically the kidneys back into the bloodstream, okay, that's going to make your urine a lot more concentrated. Okay, it's going to, and obviously that's going to add some color to it, and that's going to cause a decrease in urine output, which is a good thing. I mean, just basic logic dictates this makes sense, because if you are losing water, why in the heck would you want to excrete more of it? 
okay? And that's essentially what antidiuretic hormone does. And then once our osmolarity returns back to normal, then, you know, obviously that decreases the activity of the supraoptic nuclei. That'll start dropping the ADH levels, and then we will just return to just normal functions. Now, obviously, this is a good short-term regulator or mechanism of this, but in the long run, the ultimate way to, to get your osmolarity back to normal is to drink water, okay? And as you get dehydrated, as well, in this particular situation, I mean, how do you know you're thirsty in the first place? I mean, how do you know you're thirsty? How do you know? You get that cotton mouth, right? You get that dry mouth. Okay. You get that dry mouth. So what causes that? You know, you get that dry mouth. It feels like your throat gets a little dry, which mine feels dry all the time because I'm sick. All right. Well, where does that come from? So what's going to happen here, as, as basically, I mean, because I mean, you have to know you're thirsty. You can't just sit there and say, man, my sodium levels are getting kind of high. My osmolarity is really getting up there. You don't know that. Okay, so basically your brain tells you, hey, you know, you're thirsty by basically decreasing, you know, salivary secretions. Okay, via SNS outflow. Okay. Because remember, part of, you know, part of your autonomic nervous system control, a lot of your autonomic nervous system control comes from, you know, the, the diencephalon or the hypothalamus of the brain. Okay, so what's going to happen in this situation, remember, this is all about water retention, and a, and a big part of saliva is also water. Okay, so if you increase your sympathetic outflow to your salivary glands, that's going to decrease the amount of water being secreted into basically, you know, your mouth. All right, and then as a result, it's going to make your give your mouth that dry cotton mouth kind of feeling. All right, so then and then that's when you think, well, man, I got to make myself feel a little better. You grab some water and you start drinking it. All right, and then after a while, once you you know continuously introduce this water in your system and you absorb that water and you know through your GI tract and your osmolarity returns down to normal, then you decrease the sympathetic outflow to your salivary glands, and then you know all you know and then basically they return to kind of normal activity. Okay, so I mean, that's how you know you're thirsty, and that's what the hypothalamus does, essentially, to alert the body that you are thirsty, okay, or that, you're, that you are dehydrated, okay? It secretes antidiuretic, stimulates the secretion of antidiuretic hormone to stimulate the kidneys to retain water, and also increases sympathetic outflow to salivary glands, so you can consciously say, man, I'm thirsty, I've got to get some water in myself. Okay, and bear in mind, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, you know, that people like to say that if you're, if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. In a sense, that is true, okay, because if you're getting to the point to where your brain is making you feel thirsty, you, do, you are low in water. I mean, does that mean you're going to, you know, die or there's going to be severe consequences? No, but that does mean you should get some water in your system. And there is a, you know, I, I guess I'll get this out there. There is an, a, there is an art to hydration. Okay, you know, proper hydration is not about just trying to slug a bunch of water. You know, hydration basically is drink a little bit of water every, I don't know, every, take a couple sips of water every, you know, 15, 20 minutes, every 10 minutes, whatever, but not a lot. Okay, but you just, just a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time, slowly get that water into your system. Because if you sit there and just slug a bunch of water down all at once, it's just going to sit there in your stomach. You, you might cramp up a little bit. Um, you may absorb too much water, and then all of a sudden your blood volume goes up, then you have to pee a lot. It's just, it's just a lot easier on the system to just put a little bit in at a time. And then basically, you know, and what's the best way to tell if you're well hydrated? Well, besides if you feel thirsty or not, look at the color of your urine. You know, when I, when I ran cross country in high school, we had a motto. It was clear pee by three. Clear pee by three. Practice was at um, 3.30 in the afternoon. We got out of school at, I don't know, 3.15, 3.20, I can't remember. Um, but, but, you know, we got out of high school. Practice, you know, started between 3.30 and 3.40, 3.45, depending on how quickly we were able to get ready. And we wanted to make sure that, obviously, your urine was clear because that was an indicator that we had a healthy amount of water in our system. So we were able to maintain a normal blood volume and thermoregulator cells appropriately while we were running. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and, that's, and that's how we checked to make sure that we were properly hydrated. You know? And, you know, another thing about hydration as well 
is that by hydrating properly, that's another way to kind of keep your appetite down as well. Because if you're constantly filling yourself with water, you know, you know, running water through your stomach and GI tract, it keeps a little bit, you know, stretched. And then as a result, that keeps your appetite down. So, um, you know, hydration is a really good way to, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking to lose weight or so on, I mean, hydrate properly. Because a lot of people mistake being dehydrated for hunger. You know, like, for example, when you wake up in the middle of the night, and you go to the bathroom and you say to yourself, man, I could use a midnight snack. More often than not, you're really not hungry. You're thirsty. So go drink a big. So drink a. So drink a glass of water and go lay down and go back to bed. You'd be amazed at how quickly that hunger goes away. You know. So keep in mind that you know there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to hydration. And this whole drink eight glasses of water a day and all this jazz. That's a that's a load of hooey as well. Um, just because I mean some science. You got to remember science a long time ago was run by a very elite group of people, and there weren't a lot of scientists within the community. So when someone said something or made a discovery, you know, basically it was you know it was their you know their word was. Um, I mean, basically it was it was almost a, like a religion. You know, I mean, you just followed what they said, um, whether they're right or wrong. Um, but then, uh, you know, basically as we learn more about kidney function and so on, you learn that there really is no major set amount that a person needs to drink. Just listen, listen to your body. Okay, pay attention to your body. That's the best way to ensure that you're staying appropriately hydrated. Okay, so if someone tells you you should drink egg glasses, water, they laugh at them, say they need to uh, call them silly, um, and then educate them. Obviously, you don't want to laugh at somebody, not educate them on something, because then you know there, there's an art to doing all this, um, and then educate them about how all this works. Okay, so that essentially is anti-diuretic hormone and um, hydration and so on. And next, what I want to talk about is a, this is a system that tends to confuse a lot of people just because there's a few components to it, but it's really not that tough. <laughs> Again, sorry, bear in mind, I'm still recovering from a cold. Um, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism or system. Okay, basically, this is a system that's designed to help us maintain, you know, uh, body water levels as well, but this is a system that is more stimulated by changes in blood pressure, uh, by a drop in, you know, mean arterial pressure. And, um, you know, obviously by, you know, what's called a volume contraction or when our body water levels go down or we can say hypovolemia. Okay, hypovolemia, a drop in volume. Okay, now typically it's it's not just a drop in, in volume and a drop in, you know, blood pressure and water, also significant drop in sodium. Okay. So essentially, when we basically when we become deprived of sodium and water, which is going to equal a drop in blood pressure, that's essentially the stimulus that activates this system, okay, or this the system or this particular physiologic response. Now you have to keep this in mind. Keep this this part that I just wrote out right here. You should stop, write this down on a piece of paper for a second, and keep this in front of you while you're watching this or learning about this because. Because as we go through this and explain how this system works, you'll see how essentially this response gets your gets your blood pressure back up through getting your body water levels up and sodium levels up. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. That's what RAAS oops stands for. Okay. Let me move this box down a little bit in case I need more room. Okay, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Okay, so before we, a second ago, we said that the stimulus for this particular response is um, is a drop in blood pressure essentially caused by a combination of uh, low sodium levels and low, um, <coughs> excuse me, low sodium levels and low body water levels. And so first question you should be asking yourselves is, well, what would cause that? Okay, what would cause that? You know, severe bleeding, um, loss of blood, um, digestive system issues where you're not absorbing water and electrolytes appropriately, diarrhea, um, you know, renal, you know, in, inappropriate renal handling of sodium and water where you're eliminating too much of both and so on. Okay, um, diuretic overdoses or abuse. Um, you know, there's a good handful of factors that can cause uh, this system, you know, this system to um, take place. Okay, so basically, what happens then when people ha uh, when um, what's going to happen with this? Then you know this is a you know this is a system that begins at the kidneys. 
you have to bear with my art here, folks. This is a system that begins with the kidneys. All right. So essentially, when the uh, you know when we said when arterial pressure drops, specifically when the arterial pressure in the kidneys drops. Okay, because remember, entering the kidneys would be the renal arteries. All right, and then remember your blood flow in the kidneys, segmental arteries, interlobar, arcuates, um, the radiating arteries into the cortex um, or interlobular arteries, depending on what book you read. Okay, they eventually form the um, the afferent and the efferent arterioles. Okay. And then you've got the distal convoluted tubule nearby, and then you've got the glomerulus, these filtering capillaries. All right, so so you've got tubules in, and then blood flow out. Okay, and then we form this structure called the um, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I'm just going to abbreviate this JA. Okay, and you know again by by the time you're watching this video, you should have already gone over the anatomy of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I haven't made a video on this yet, but again. Um, you know, this would be a good time if you haven't gone over this uh, to go back and grab your anatomy book and review the anatomy of this. Okay, and remember the juxtaglomerular apparatus is caused by these juxtaglomerular cells, um, kind of around the distal convoluted tubule and the arterioles. Um, and then remember there are these specialized cells called the macula densa within the distal convoluted tubule as it as it passes by the um, glomerulus. And remember these are sensitive to changes in extracellular sodium. Okay, so what's going to happen then if we have a significant decline in blood pressure and we just have less blood flowing in here, that's going to be less fluid just going in through the nephron itself. Okay, if we have less, you know, if we, because if we, remember, uh, remember the importance of blood pressure. Blood pressure ultimately is what allows us to undergo these fluid exchanges between blood and tissues. Also, fluid, you know, blood pressure also allows us to basically create urine. If we have a severe drop in blood pressure, you're going to be unable to force fluids out of the, you know, out of the glomerulus and into the nephron. So what's going to happen then is that's going to cause a decrease in essentially water and sodium within the within the nephron. So basically, as um, as this tubular fluid flows by the macula densa, it's going to see a significant drop in in sodium and water, and then that's going to basically stimulate these juxta um, these juxtaglomerular cells to secrete renin into the bloodstream. Okay, now so we'll start with renin. Okay, remember. Renin is an enzyme. Renin is not a hormone. Renin is not a chemical messenger. Renin is an enzyme. It's a classic mistake a lot of people make is they think of it as a, as a chemical message. It is not. Okay. What renin is going to do is it's going to work its way into the bloodstream, and then it's going to come in contact with a plasma protein called angiotensinogen. Okay, this is a plasma protein, like most plasma proteins, that is manufactured in the liver. Okay, manufactured in the liver. All right, and then essentially what this is going to do, excuse me, um, what this is going to do, and this is a relatively large protein, and what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to cleave off a bunch of amino acids, and it's going to form this small little 10 amino acid chain protein uh, called angio tensin 1, angiotensin 1, okay? So renin is the enzyme that initiates this kind of this cascade of chemical reactions. And remember, it does this by converting this inactive plasma protein into angiotensin 1. Now, angiotensin 1, think of the name before we go any further with this. Angio, remember, angio means vessel, okay? Okay, angio means vessel, tensin. Well, that's pretty obvious. Tension, right? So think about this. If angiotensin, if oops, okay, if we increase the amount of tension in a vessel, that's going to cause it to constrict. Okay, and remember, by constricting vessels, you know, especially arterioles, that's going to cause an increase in peripheral resistance, force the heart to work harder, and increase blood pressure. You know, remember the the the, the greater the increase to blood flow the greater the heart's going to have to work to elevate blood pressure. Okay, but angiotensin 1 is relatively weak. It's not very good at doing this. So it's going to, so this is going to, even though this is active, it's not very good. And it's going to circulate in the blood until it gets into the pulmonary capillaries. Okay, and in the pulmonary capillaries, there is this enzyme called angiotensin 
converting enzyme. Angiotensin converting enzyme. And what that's going to do is that's going to convert this into angiotensin 2. This is what we want, angiotensin 2. Okay, angiotensin 2, and basically what this enzyme does, it just cleaves off two more amino acids, and then we you know, have this more um, potent version of, this, uh, of the original message, angiotensin 1. Okay, and remember, this enzyme is located in the pulmonary capillaries. Okay, pulmonary capillaries. Now, <laughs> angiotensin 2 is going to do a couple of things. Angiotensin 2 is essentially going to um, increase thirst. Okay. It's going to stimulate the secretion of ADH. And it's going to stimulate the secretion of a hormone called aldosterone. Okay, a hormone called aldosterone. Let's do this on another page. I'm getting kind of clustered here. Okay, so let's talk about these for a second. So remember, angiotensin 2. Okay, it's going to basically, you know, it's going to, you know, think of these three major effects that it's going to stimulate. Increase in thirst. So obviously, the hypothalamus is going to come in contact with this. Also, an increase in ADH, which is going to stimulate an increase in water retention and an increase in the secretion of the hormone, aldosterone. Okay. Aldosterone is nicknamed the salt retaining hormone. Again, pardon the horrid handwriting here. The salt retaining hormone. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. Well, this just logically makes sense. If you're losing water, remember the, remember the stimulus for the secretion of this hormone. A drop in water plus a drop in sodium equals a drop in blood pressure. Okay, remember that general rule. Wherever sodium goes, water goes. Okay. So if we're low on water, it just makes sense that we get thirsty. Okay. Also, we want to retain water. We don't want the kidneys to be eliminating any more water than they have to. So we just talked about the effects of ADH. So this is going to stimulate just an increased secretion of antidiuretic hormone. Okay. So these two mechanisms alone are going to directly allow us to increase our water content. Okay. Aldosterone, on the other hand, salt-retaining hormone, this stimulates the retention of sodium and the excretion oops, of potassium. Okay, remember wherever sodium goes, water goes. Okay, so let's talk about aldosterone for a second. So basically, what aldosterone is going to do is, you know, within the distal convoluted tubule primarily, and in the, a little bit in the collecting ducts as well, that's going to activate sodium potassium pumps. Okay, sodium potassium pumps. So what that's going to do is, well, remember, sodium potassium pumps move sodium one direction, potassium in the other. Okay, remember, sodium pumped out, potassium is always pumped in with sodium potassium pumps. So in this scenario, what you're going to see is you're going to see sodium pumped out of the nephron where it's going to get reabsorbed back into the blood. Okay, and then at the same time, potassium is going to get pumped into the tubular fluid of the nephron. Okay, which is going to cause you to eliminate more potassium. Okay, but, you know, that's why we call this a salt-retaining hormone. Okay, we're retaining this particular salt, sodium. And then remember, wherever sodium goes, water goes. So that's going to help us draw more, so or more sodium, draw more water into our bloodstream and allow us to get our levels up. Okay, now, a little clinical application with this. Let's think of a diabetic, a person who does not, especially a diabetic who does not take their insulin. Okay, a person who does not take their insulin is going to eventually undergo something called DKA, you know, type 1 diabetic we're talking about in particular here. So diabetic ketoacidosis. 
So what you're going to see in these individuals, remember your three P's of diabetes, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia. Okay, okay so what's going to happen is blood sugar levels get, you know, get really high. Once they start getting around that threshold of about 220 to 225 milligrams a deciliter, uh, per deciliter of sugar. Okay, remember any anywhere below that the kidneys retain we reabsorb 100% glucose from the from the nephron back into the bloodstream. So normally you shouldn't have any sugar in your urine. Okay, but if you are um, you know if you're not taking your insulin and your blood sugar levels just skyrocket, what's going to happen is your kidneys are going to have to are going to attempt to keep your blood sugar levels down, and you're going to eliminate excess sugar in the urine. And you know, you know, remember carbohydrates essentially. <laughs> carbohydrates are hydrophilic molecules that are going to exert some osmotic pressure on fluids. And as you eliminate these carbohydrates, um, as you're as you're trying to eliminate these these sugars in the urine, that's going to draw or drag a bunch of water into the nephron with them. Okay, which is so as, as you're building up more water in the tubular fluid, you're going to have, excuse me, an increased urine output, hence polyuria. Well, obviously, if you're peeing excessively and losing excessive water, that's where the thirst comes in. And being that you're not metabolizing carbohydrates properly, especially the brain um, and other tissues of the body, it's going to make you hungry. Okay, now. You can, you can put this all together. You're losing a lot of fluid. Okay, you're you know you're moving a lot of water and salts through here at a very rapid rate, and you're going to be and and basically as you're losing all this fluid, that's going to and salts that's going to cause a significant decrease in blood pressure, which in in in, a, in turn is going to activate this response. Okay, and then what you're going to see in people that are undergoing this is you know almost all the time when a, when a person is in you know a diabetic is in this state and they're brought into the emergency room oftentimes you have to hang you have to give them IV potassium okay because remember part of this is the secretion of aldosterone so as their aldosterone levels are rising and they're trying to retain sodium so they can retain water they're going to be eliminating a lot of potassium in their urine Okay, so after you do your blood testing, your urinalysis, and so on, okay, you know it's important that they get IV potassium to keep their potassium levels normal because they'll become what are what's called a hypokalemic, and I'll talk more about that later on. But that's just a little clinical application to this. Now, let me ask you guys this. Let me ask you guys this for a second. I want to give you a second to think about this. Would you use this particular physiologic response during exercise? Would this be a physiologic response you would use during exercise? Think about it. The answer is no. The answer is no. Okay. Now, if you're thinking yes, you're probably thinking, well, I'm losing water. I'm sweating out some salts. So why would I not undergo this? What was the initial stimulus in the first place? A drop in blood pressure during exercise. What happens to your blood pressure? It goes up because remember all that sympathetic outflow to the heart and 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 the vessels and the, all the vasoconstriction to your core and dilation to your muscles and all that. But more specifically, the dramatically increased activity of the heart is going to make your blood pressure go up. So even though you are losing fluids, okay, and you are losing some electrolytes, your blood pressure is already high. Okay, so that so basically that stimulus would not so basically that situation would not cause an engagement of the system. Okay. And bear in mind that also when you are profusely sweating during exercise, you're losing a disproportionate amount of water and electrolytes. Okay, and that which is going to cause that drop in, or I'm sorry, that increase in osmolarity and an increase in ADH levels. Okay, so this is a so so that so exercise would not be a scenario for this particular physiologic response. 
The last mechanism that I briefly want to talk about is a hormone called atrial natriuretic peptide. So we, so we talked about two different situations where we're deprived of fluids and, and so on. This, is, and this hormone typically is, secre is secreted when, when, our, when our water volumes expand or when we accumulate too much water. Okay, and think of the name right there. Atrial, okay, atrial. Well, this is telling you it's being secreted from the atria of the heart, okay, and also the, you know, all right, so the atria of the heart, okay, natriuretic, okay, basically, you know, a diuretic, and peptide, this is a protein, and the target for this is the kidneys, okay, so essentially, when we have this volume expansion or hypervolemia, we increase our body water content that, and increase our blood volume, that's going to increase the stretch on the aorta and atria, okay? It's going to increase the stretch on those particular structures. And as those structures, you know, increase their stretch and, um, and you know, become expanded, um, what's going to happen then is that's going to stimulate the release of this particular hormone. And, you know, again, from the more, more specifically, the left atrium. Okay, the left atrium. Now, what this hormone is going to do is it's going to go to the kidneys and it's going to increase the excretion of sodium, hence the term natriuretic. Okay, increase in the loss of sodium. And just remember that general rule of thumb. Wherever sodium goes, water goes. So if you're eliminating more sodium in the urine, you're dragging more water in the urine into the urine, and you're and you're peeing out more urine. Or peeing out more urine that makes sense. Okay, you're peeing out more water. Okay, so so basically, and then and then obviously, you know, negative feedback here. Once body water levels get down, and that pressure on the left atrium goes down, then that's going to inhibit the secretion of this hormone. Okay, so this is a relatively simple hormone to talk about. Basically, just increase blood pressure, increase stretch on the atria, and then as a result, you are going to eliminate more sodium and also eliminate more water. Okay, now bear in mind that um, this, is a, this is a particular hormone that is going to antagonize or work against aldosterone and angiotensin II. Okay, and you know, so this is going to work against because remember, when your blood pressure is high, you're not going to be you're not going to be you know cranking out renin in your system. Okay, and so on, you know, because your blood pressure is already high. So this is the antagonist of the renin and, and, and angiotensin aldosterone system. And one, gosh dang it, I forgot to mention one another. Uh, uh, Another clinical application to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, I'm assuming you guys have heard of an ACE inhibitor. Okay, an ACE inhibitor essentially blocks the activity of this enzyme. Angiotensin converting enzyme is otherwise known as ACE. Okay, ACE. So basically, by, um, you know, there are some people out there that have, you know, so basically there are people out there that have excessive activity of, you know, renin and angiotensin and so on. And as a result, um, need to be careful with their sodium intake. And a part of that, and, and, and as a result, if you have increased activity in the system, that will, um, even even if their sodium levels are kind of somewhat normal. So what's going to happen then is that's, you're going to have to, and that's going to cause an increase in blood pressure. Some people have to take ACE inhibitor medications, and then that medication blocks the activity of that, um, and basically makes it a little easier for you to eliminate sodium. So people that take ACE inhibitors need to be a little wary of their sodium intake as well, because remember, wherever sodium goes, water goes. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of some major hormonal mechanisms that we use to regulate body water levels in the human body. Um, you know, again, if you have, if you folks have any questions about this, let me know. And bear in mind, keep this basic concept in you know in your head that um, you know when it comes down to regulating water levels, and you, as you saw through all this, that you know we reg we essentially regulate body water levels by regulating the osmolarity of our body fluids or the um, you know the the solute concentration of our body fluids, and the and the one we tend to focus on the most is sodium. Okay, so again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me, and everybody take care.